Hello, this is Eric Peterson, Innovation Manager at Corporator. Today, I'm going to give a brief demo on Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations are how we calculate value at risk. Before we get into that, I just want to explain a little bit about what this entails. Uh, with value at risk, what we do is we simulate whether or not risk events occur. Uh, and then what we do is we also simulate the impact, or this is a consequence. This is usually measured um, in, in uh, financial terms like dollars, euros, whatever currency. Um, you select some level of certainty, usually 95%, and then it spits out things like histograms, percentile tables, and contribution charts. We'll take a look at, at what this actually means in the software in a moment. Before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about how we set this up. Uh, we use a very flexible approach. Uh, the idea is we don't really know how you have your business organized. Uh, most customers will generally uh, show value at risk organizationally, like how different business units contribute. But they might also use things like functions, risk categories. Risk categories can be things like um, uh, how, how you organize them, whether they're legal risks, for instance, or, or uh, reputational risks. You get the idea. Um, but anyway, we, we uh, set it up so you can map whatever categories you want, uh, and then we will break out the contribution as, as to how they impact the overall value at risk. Another thing that's important to, to consider is that this is designed to support hundreds of risks per scenario. And what this means is that uh, it's, we, we need to support iterative work, because if you want to get 100 risks in, uh, you might find that you have duplicates and you might want to rerun things. Uh, if you have like, let, let's just say you have 600 risks going in and you need to, to choose 500 specific risks that go into the scenario, uh, you don't want to spend all your time trying to, to find those specific risks. So we make it easy to uh, reuse your selections and work iteratively. Another thing I want to just briefly discuss is that uh, customers uh, use all sorts of different um, models for managing risks operationally. Uh, they have different um, calculation logic for how risk treatment plans or control measures will reduce the probability or that will reduce uh, the overall impact. Uh, they might have different uh, multi-year values, different time windows, and so on. So uh, what we do is we, we let you have this kind of customer-centric con um, customer configuration that, uh, that you set up. Uh, and it really doesn't matter what that is because we use a mapper. We know what kind of inputs we need to run scenarios. And again, we'll take a look at that uh, in, in a second. But what, what this means is generally you will have what, what's called a distribution uh, and that is used to determine how the the uh, impact is calculated. Um, sometimes you might know specifically what the impact is. That that might be a fixed value. In that case, we don't really use a distribution. But um, normally, you will have like a minimum and a maximum value. You've got some sort of bandwidth, or you've got some some range, uh, and then we will will generate a value within that range. Uh, sometimes there will be an expected value, in which case you probably have something like a triangular distribution or uh, what's called PERT. I don't want to go all into the, the theory behind Monte Carlo or how that works. I have another um, uh, video about that, uh, but rather I just want to go into the product side of things. But the point is we use a mapper that, that kind of separates uh, the scenarios from how you deal with risk operationally. And what people typically do, if you look at the lower part of the screen here, this becomes the value at risk calculation. It's kind of like the last step in reporting. Uh, so there, there are some uh, different uh, compliance or regulatory frameworks that companies need to follow. Uh, and often they need to have a value at risk that is within some sort of acceptable tolerance or range. So normally the value at risk is, is uh, relative to some sort of metric or some sort of KPI. It's kind of the final part of a reporting process. And we don't really want to interfere with how people are doing the whole risk identification, the assessment, the treatment side of things. Uh, we just want to be able to plug in at the last minute. And that's why we use a mapper just simply makes things more flexible. So let's take a look at the demo. All right, we're on the web and what you see here is what I would call a, a risk aggregation dashboard. It could be called the value at risk 
dashboard. It, it could be called whatever you want, but basically what we have is some sort of interface for working with scenarios. Uh, there's a couple of things to think about. Uh, one is what risks are actually going to be available. And for, and you can set this up how you want. But in this example, I've just set this up where, where we have a bunch of different risks. Uh, you can see this is paginated. So I actually have four pages of these risks. We have different distributions, uh, different categories. Uh, we can also say that uh, risks might be related to each other. I'll come into what that means in a moment, but what this lets us do is, is compare risks as a group. Uh, we also have the business units, and, and you can set up whatever kind of categories or metadata you want in here um, so that, that you can um, break these risks down you know, by business unit, risk category, and so on. Um, and then based on the distribution, we, we've got a set of inputs that come in. Uh, this is designed, I can make this editable. So if I need to change things at the last minute, I can do that. Um, the idea here being that some of these might be risks with errors, as you can see here. These are risks with errors. Why are they errors? If, if you look here, we, we see the probability is three. In our system, a one uh, means 100%. So you cannot have probability of three. So this one is kind of separated. It's split out so we can fix it down here. Um, also, this one, we, we see this as a normal distribution. Uh, a normal distribution isn't really defined by this min, base, and max. It actually needs this kind of uh, mean and standard deviation. These inputs are missing. So this is kind of spit out. It's excluded uh, from our risks. But this is what we have to work with. Okay, and then when we want to uh, create a new risk uh, or a new uh, simulation, what we do here is we can we can have different types of simulations set up. Um, this is like a single year simulation. This is one that will have a correlation matrix. You can also set up different time windows, like two years or five years. Um, but, but for for this demo, we'll just do something with uh, one year. So this is a uh, one year. It's uh, for the demo. Um, this will be for the reporting period of Q1 2022. Um, if you want to make a description because it's iterative, we could just say that this is the first draft. And then we just hit submit. Uh, once we hit submit, uh, the way it works here is we can set the confidence level. I will just add it just, just so you can see it. But if, if you leave it empty, it's, uh, it's going to be 95%. Um, you can change it to whatever you want between 0 and 1. Uh, 90, 95 are probably um, the, the typical values that people will choose. Um, from here, we have this the selection table. And again, this is, this is uh, paginated, so we've got a bunch of things. Um, it just sometimes it's easier to, to break this down. Uh, you can also um, search for different things, like if, if you have a whole bunch of risks um, you know, you can find specific ones uh, or, you know, you can start with selecting all and then maybe excluding the risks uh, that you want to remove from this. Um, at any rate, once you've made your selections and we can take a few others out on this page, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time naming these risks, as you can see, but I don't really want to distract from the functionality. But at any time, you, you can run this. Uh, or you can save the selections. If you're not quite ready to run it, you can save it and come back later. doesn't really matter. Even if you run it, you can rerun these. But let's just run the simulation. Um, this is, again, is designed to take uh, hundreds of risks. Um, we've tested it with thousands. I don't really know what the limits are. It's probably based on, on like the server memory and that sort of thing. I'm just running this on a laptop. Um, and it's, uh, I think it works pretty quickly. Uh, it's not like you have to come back uh, an hour later or wait for something to be emailed to you. It just will run this while you wait. And what it's doing is it's running 100,000 uh, samples uh, and then um, compiling the results at your specified confidence level. Now, this risk, again, we said we want to be 95% certain. So if we look at our, um, our uh, results, we can see... 95% certainty, we get a nice little um, uh, line here showing us where that is. And uh, that means that 95% that of the results are gonna be to the left of this line. So this is kind of the cumulative uh, percentile. 
you can see at the bottom cumulative uh, frequency and then we get to you know the 95 is right in about here this is where the line is and then it will say that our value at risk is 258 million which is right around here and if we look at the actual percentile table we can actually sort on the uh, selected quantile so if we do this you can just see that uh, these risks are contributing the most so these would be our top risks what's interesting too just you know for reference values i put uh, 20 percent probability but if i sort here let's get it like this you see this this risk here risk factor five and 49 well let, let, let's look at this one risk factor 005 um, if we go back to the reference, this is what, where we kind of freeze the values that had gone in, um, meaning that if things were to change later in terms of the min, the base, and the max, this cannot be edited. This tells you the exact inputs that went in. So if you ever want to audit your results, you can take a look at it. This is that risk number five that we were looking at. That's going really high at the low percentile. And that is because that is 100% probability. So this is basically occurring all the time. It's just, I just point that out just because it's it's just, I don't know, math is fun. It just kind of shows you how things uh, contribute at, at different levels. Uh, but let's go back to the selected quantile because that's really where it's most relevant because we want to see what contributes most here at 95% uh, certainty. Now, maybe rather than looking at these in a table, we want to break these out. And if we go into the contribution page, we can set up these different uh, different ways of uh, showing contribution. In this case, we're showing by, by the category. Um, so th these are the, the different um, categories of risk or by business unit, as you see here. Uh, right now, I'm showing the contribution by percentage. Um, you can also, if you prefer, you could show the contribution in terms of the raw value, in terms of the whatever currency that, that, that you're looking at. But here, this should ostensibly uh, add up to, to 100, approximately 100%. Uh, or we can just show the top 10 risks. And again, it's the top 10 at the 95th percentile. Because as we saw a moment ago, the top risk at the 5th percentile was the risk that's occurring all the time, 100% certainty. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, we freeze the input values. So I, I cannot edit the values inside this table. This is just frozen in time. These are the, the inputs that, that went in, you know, showing you the risk names, the, the uh, distributions, the min, base, max, probability. If, if, it's a, if we're using the standard deviation or mean, these values would be here and so on. Now, because this is iterative, what I can also do is I can I can add this to my report because if, if I have more than one scenario that I'm computing for a given period in time, um, I need to pick the final one. So if I click Add to Report, what I will do here is mark this to be included in the report. So if we look at our aggregation dashboard, this is that first draft, the one we just made. This is now added to the report. So this value of 258 should show up here under my um, risk report. So, uh, and this is how companies normally will, will do the actual reporting. They don't just do the, the uh, value at risk just as you know a value and the percent certainty. They will want to show it against some other metrics. Usually it's something related to um, equity or cash flow or um, liquidity. I mean, there's generally some some standard metrics that they want to measure this against. So they, they see if this number is, you know, how this looks relative to whatever uh, KPIs that they want. Also for reports, maybe they want to show some additional uh, top three risks um, they'll probably extract uh, again the the uh, the histogram um, and maybe even show the, the contribution because this I think is a bit more relevant to be showing which risk categories are the highest. In this case, it's financial, which makes sense. Also, which which business units are contributing the most.
Um, so they'll typically pull those out also uh, into a report. Um, that's, uh, that's it in, in a summary for the basic Monte Carlo simulation. I just want to discuss a few other things that, that sometimes people want to add. And I, I just, um, I guess, will be a bit cautionary about how, how you set these things up. Uh, you can also do things like with, uh, with correlations. Um, like you, maybe you want to have some sort of uh, correlation matrix. Um, I really have mixed feelings about this. Um, there's a couple problems that can arise when you have correlations. Uh, one is that you can have what are called statistical singularities. I won't bore you with, with um, the definition of that, but I will just say that uh, singularities cannot be detected through validating your input. I mean, we cannot predict when a singularity will occur. I mean, they occur during runtime. Um, and part of the problem with, with these kind of correlations are that if you chain many risks together, um, you know, you can start to have circular references. That, that's one problem. Uh, you can have challenges having a good um, uh, user interface for, for how you're going to set these up. If you get into some sort of causality, then we need to evaluate these risks in sequence. You know, when we have like 100,000 of these, maybe the first time we have to do risk A, then risk B, then risk C, because they're kind of in a sequence. And the next time we start with risk B, and then C, and then A, and, and, and so on. We have to kind of do the different permutations. And if you know anything about math, uh, if you have um, too many combinations, you, you end up multiplying these together to get the total number of permutations. Uh, those won't even fit within the 100,000 samples that we have. So then you're basically going to be um, excluding data, just kind of truncating part of the data set. And um, I've, I've seen some some other tools um, that, that other people use that do exactly that. But it, it's not entirely clear what those rules are, like why uh, the data is truncated or, or how that's decided. The other thing you start to get into when you, when you want to do these kind of correlations is you also have kind of the inverse correlation. If, if you want to say that these risks are dependent on, on each other or they, they occur together, you're also... Uh, opening up to say that if risk A occurs, then risk B cannot occur. And then again, you can run into some major logic problems that uh, if you have a whole bunch of risks together, um, you're, you're not really, um, it's not really apparent how this stuff all fits together. And you're also in effect changing the overall probability. Uh, because if you're saying that a risk is going to show up in 20% of the scenarios, but then you place all these other conditions on it, it could show up in far more than 20% or far less than 20%. So it, it's, it's, it's not really uh, apparent to the end user. Uh, and then you end up basically creating a black box. We don't really know what is uh, creating your results. So I recommend not uh, going all in uh, and trying to do correlations or causality with risks. Uh, rather, if you take this kind of approach where, where you just um, plug them in, um, you can very easily validate the results. I mean, if, if you know um, how distributions work and you know how probability works, uh, you can put in reference values and you can see that these uh, simulations deliver exactly what they say uh, they should deliver from the inputs. I mean, it starts to make sense. Uh, you can see some of those those um, visuals on the the other video that I have. That's more on the theory behind this. How how the data starts to stack up. Like, why does this have this kind of shape? Um, and uh, why is it called the triangle? Why is it called the pert? Why is it called the uniform when you start seeing those shapes? And then you start stacking multiple uniform distributions. You'll see that the, the, the overall distribution starts to look like a normal distribution. Again, um, I don't want to get all into the theory of it, but I'm just saying uh, when you use a very straightforward approach, it's very easy for the audit committee to audit the data and to, to um, compare the output um, provided by the software against the input 
that went in. Uh, if you're doing all this stuff with correlations, inverse correlations, causality, and all of that stuff, uh, again, it will quickly turn into a black box. So my recommendation is to keep things very, very simple. Um, I think the only other thing just to mention is that in, in this example, I am just exclusively focusing on the calculation behind the value at risk and then how the results are brought back into a report. Um, behind the scenes here, there, there's probably some sort of operational side of handling risk where, you know, you start with a, um, a gross probability and a gross impact, and then you're using your risk treatments and your controls to reduce the probability and to reduce the overall impacts. And, and that's when, when you end up kind of with these net values. And it's these net values, ultimately, that we are feeding in uh, to the distribution and throwing them into this type of uh, risk dashboard and uh, scenario model um, that you see here. So anyway, I hope some of this makes sense. If, if you want to take a closer look, you can contact us as a company and we can give you a, um, either more information or a more detailed demo or a bit of a workshop into how this all works. Um, but I think it's a, it's a pretty elegant uh, solution that we have here. And um, I thank you for listening.